the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Brethren, let us acknowledge our sins and so prepare ourselves to celebrate the sacred mystery. I confess, and to you, my brothers and sisters, that I have greatly sinned in my thoughts and in my words, in what I have done and in what I have failed to do, through my fault, through my fault, through my most grievous fault. Therefore, I ask, Blessed Mary, ever Virgin, all the angels and saints, and you, my brothers and sisters, to pray for me to the Lord our God. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life.
us pray. Look upon us, O God, creator and ruler of all things, and that we may feel the working of your mercy. Grant that we may serve you with all our heart. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. A reading from the book of Exodus. The Lord said to Moses, go down at once to your people whom you brought out of the land of Egypt, for they have become depraved. They have soon turned aside from the way I pointed out to them, making for themselves a molten calf and worshiping it, sacrificing to it and crying out, This is your God, O Israel, who brought you out of the land of Egypt. I see how stiff-necked this people is, continued the Lord to Moses. Let me alone then, that my wrath may blaze up against them to consume them. Then I will make of you a great nation. But Moses implored the Lord, his God, saying, Why, O Lord, should your wrath blaze up against your own people, whom you brought out of the land of Egypt, with such great power and with so strong a hand? Remember your servants, Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, and how you swore to them by your own self, saying, I will make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky, and all this land that I promised, I will give your descendants as their perpetual heritage. So the Lord relented in the punishment he had threatened to inflict on his people. The word of the Lord.
A reading from the first letter of St. Paul to Timothy. Beloved, I am grateful to him who has strengthened me, Christ Jesus our Lord, because he considered me trustworthy in appointing me to the ministry. I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and arrogant, but I have been mercifully treated because I acted out of ignorance in my unbelief. Indeed, the grace of our Lord has been abundant, along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. This saying is trustworthy and deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Of these I am the foremost. But for that reason, I was mercifully treated so that in me, as the foremost, Christ Jesus might display all his patience as an example for those who would come to believe in him for everlasting life. To the King of ages, incorruptible, invisible, the only God, honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. The word of the Lord. from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. Tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to listen to Jesus. But the Pharisees and scribes began to complain, saying, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. So to them he addressed this parable. What man among you, having a hundred sheep and losing one of them, would not leave the ninety-nine in the desert and go after the one, the lost one, until he finds it? When he does find it, he sets it on his shoulders with great joy, and upon arrival at his home, he calls together his friends and neighbors and says to them, Rejoice with me, because I have found my lost sheep. I tell you, in just the same way, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous people who have no need of repentance. Or what woman, having ten coins and losing one, would not light a lamp and sweep the house, searching carefully until she finds it? And when she does find it, she calls together her friends and neighbors and says to them, Rejoice with me, because I have found the coin that I lost. In just the same way, I tell you, 
there will be rejoicing among the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Then he said, a man had two sons, and the younger son said to his father, Father, give me the share of your estate that, I should, that should come to me. So the father divided the property between them. After a few days, the younger son collected all his belongings and set off to a distant country where he squandered his inheritance on a life of dissipation. When he had freely spent everything, a severe famine struck that country, and he found himself in dire need. So he hired himself out to one of the local citizens who sent him to his farm to tend the swine. And he longed to eat his fill of the pods on which the swine fed, but nobody gave him any. Coming to his senses, he thought, how many of my father's hired workers have more than enough food to eat? But here am I, dying of hunger. I shall get up and go to my father, and I shall say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I no longer deserve to be called your son. Treat me as you would treat one of your hired workers. So he got up and went back to his father. While he was still a long way off, his father caught sight of him and was filled with compassion. He ran to his son, embraced him, and kissed him. His son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I no longer deserve to be called your son. But his father ordered his servants, quickly, Bring the finest robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Take the fatted calf and slaughter it. Then let us celebrate with a feast, because this son of mine was dead and has come to life again. He was lost and has been found. Then the celebration began. Now the older son had been out in the field and on his way back, as he neared the house, he heard the sound of music and dancing. He called one of the servants and asked what this might mean. The servant said to him, Your brother has returned, and your father has slaughtered the fatted calf, because he has him back safe and sound. He became angry, and when he refused to enter the house, his father came out and pleaded with him. He said to his father in reply, Look, all these years I served you, and not once did I disobey your orders, yet you never gave me even a young goat to feast on with my friends. But when your son returns, who swallowed up your property with prostitutes, for him you slaughter the fatted calf. He said to him, My son, you are here with me always. Everything I have is yours. But now we must celebrate and rejoice because your brother was dead and has come to life again. He was lost and has been found. The Gospel of the Lord. This saying is trustworthy and deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. St. Paul wrote those words to a man named Timothy, a friend and colleague of Paul's whom the apostle appointed to be the first bishop of Ephesus. The New Testament contains two letters from Paul to Timothy, and today is the first of seven consecutive Sundays 
on which the second lesson is taken from either 1st or 2nd Timothy. During these seven weeks, please read and study all of both of these letters, which together run to about eight or nine pages in your Bible. This saying is trustworthy and deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Then Paul continues, of these, I am the foremost, but for that reason, I was mercifully treated so that in me, Christ Jesus might display all his patience as an example for those who would come to believe in him for everlasting life. Paul is candid about his sins, not as an exhibitionist boasting of his own wickedness, but as a convert eager for others to know the same grace of forgiveness he has received. So he goes on, I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and arrogant, but I have been mercifully treated because I acted out of ignorance in my unbelief. And this is the theme of all the scripture readings today. God is patient with our sins and offers us the mercy which restores us to the dignity of his children, which is damaged by sin. In the first lesson from Exodus, we read that the children of Israel had fallen into idolatry and depravity and had ceased to worship the living and true God who revealed himself to their fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But despite their sins, Moses stands in the breach on their behalf and pleads for mercy, not to change God's plan for them, as a superficial reading of the text might suggest, but to open his own heart and those of the people to the possibility of conversion instead of destruction, of reconciliation instead of permanent estrangement. Then the psalmist sings of God's eternal loving kindness from which not even our sins can separate us forever if we are penitent. Have mercy on me, O God, in your goodness, in the greatness of your compassion, wipe out my offense, thoroughly wash me from my guilt, and of my sins cleanse me. And finally, in the gospel, sinners and tax collectors who know that they are living in ways contrary to the law of love draw near to the Lord Jesus to hear him teach. But as they do so, some scribes and Pharisees who also live in ways contrary to the law of love, but who will not admit it either to themselves or to God, object to Christ welcoming sinners and sharing a meal with them. And so the Lord teaches them the true meaning of mercy in three parables, the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son. In the parable of the lost sheep, Jesus likens God to a shepherd who risks everything to seek and find one sheep which is strayed from the fold and insists that heaven rejoices more over the repentance of one sinner than over the holiness of 99 who need no repentance. Then in the parable of the lost coin, Christ compares God to a simple woman with only 10 coins who goes in frantic search of one which is lost and who upon finding it, shares her joy with everyone she knows. In the same way, the Savior teaches, the angels rejoice over one sinner who repents. And finally, Christ unfolds for the scribes and Pharisees the beautiful parable of the lost son. Who of us is not stirred deeply by the loving father's constant vigilance for the return of his sinful son and his profound joy on the son's arrival home? But the prodigal who wandered away into self-indulgent depravity is not the son who remains lost. No, the father had two sons, and the older brother is the one who is truly lost, though he knows it not. Like the scribes and Pharisees, the older son is proud of his obedience to the father, but this pride has bound up his heart with resentment and envy, 
which choke out even the possibility of authentic love for his father and brother. The older son needs to let go of his self-righteousness to learn the lesson of mercy and find the joy that comes from forgiveness. And Christians of every time and place need to learn this lesson, including us. But if self-righteousness is an impediment to reconciliation with God, so too is impenitence. And impenitence in our time is aided and abetted all too often by a false understanding of mercy. As too many use that word today, mercy means that it does not matter what anyone does so long as they are sincere in their belief that they are living in fidelity to their true selves. But my friends, because of the fall from grace, we cannot know our true selves until we have been forgiven of our sins and learned to live in the freedom of the children of God. And a false understanding of mercy may actually leave us in our sins, living in a way contrary to the gospel, all the while we think it is freedom. In fact, this inverted meaning of mercy can actually make true mercy impossible, because by refusing to acknowledge that our sins really are sins, we assert that there is nothing to forgive. It's as though the prodigal son became content with eating pig slop and living in squalor far from home because he continued to insist that the rules of conduct in his father's house were an unacceptable limitation of his authentic freedom. Or imagine that he returned home to say to his father, look, I'm willing to come back, but only if I can continue to squander your money on prostitutes. In such a scenario, there is not yet room for mercy. God be praised for his tender mercies, which are made new each morning. God be praised for the forgiveness of our sins by the broken body and now poured blood of Jesus Christ. God be praised that Christ came to call not the righteous, but sinners to repentance. But we cannot praise God for these blessings if we think that mercy means we can call our sins virtues and then keep them as treasured possessions and authentic expressions of our true identity. And the church's sacred duty to teach the gospel to the ends of the earth, including the mercy of God, also demands that we teach the full truth about sin to everyone, including those who are slave to sin, but still call their sins freedom. To appreciate the true quality of mercy, we must remember that the Hebrews were in fact lost in depravity and idolatry when Moses stood in the breach for them. We must acknowledge that Saul of Tarsus was really a blasphemer and a persecutor when Christ revealed himself to Saul and changed his life. We must understand that the sheep and the coin were both truly lost and needed to be found before the rejoicing could begin. And we must grasp that both sons of the loving father were lost in different ways and needed to learn the truth about mercy, which can happen only when we acknowledge that our sins are sins and that we need to be reconciled to God by forgiveness. And that is why on Easter Sunday morning, the Lord Jesus gave us the gift of the sacrament of penance and reconciliation. By humbly confessing our sins in that sacrament, We are acknowledging the ways in which we have separated ourselves from God, from others, and from our true selves. And only then do we receive mercy and the restoration to our place in the Father's house as the children of God by the grace of adoption. And so we rejoice to pray with the psalmist, a clean heart create for me, O God, and a steadfast spirit renew within me. Cast me not out from your presence, and your Holy Spirit take not from me. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth shall proclaim your praise. My sacrifice, O God, is a contrite heart, a heart contrite and humbled, O God. 
you will not spurn. Amen. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. I believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, consubstantial with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us men and for our salvation he came down from heaven. And by the Holy Spirit was incarnate of the Virgin Mary and became man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried and rose again on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. I believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. I confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and I look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us with confidence present our petitions at the throne of grace. For the peace from above, for the loving kindness of God, and for the salvation of our souls. Christ, hear us. Christ, graciously hear us. For all bishops, priests, and deacons, for all religious men and women, for our seminarians, and for all the baptized. Christ, hear us. Christ, graciously hear us. For those who hold authority in our nation, our state, and our community, Christ, hear us. Christ, graciously hear us. For the elderly and the sick, for the widowed and the lonely, for those without work or without friends, Christ, hear us. Christ, graciously hear us. For all who have died in the hope of the resurrection and for all the dead, Christ, hear us. Christ, Heavenly Father, accept the prayers of your people and in the multitude of your mercies, look with compassion upon all who turn to you for help. For you are gracious, O Lord, and to you we give all honor and glory, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. We welcome all our visitors and hope you'll come again soon. Please see the e-bulletin for information about many ways to be involved in prayer, service, study, and recreation in our parish and diocese. And if you're not receiving the e-bulletin each Friday, you can sign up to do so on the parish website. The Knights of Columbus are serving brunch in Pasden Hall, and all are invited to stay after Mass. These monthly meals provide an opportunity to bond with others in the parish and help the Knights assist our parish community in many ways. So come and eat with the parish family. 
Finally, walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, an offering and sacrifice to God.
Pray, brethren, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty God. May the Lord accept the sacrifice of your hands, to the praise and glory of his name, for our good and the call of his holy church. Look with favor on our supplications, O Lord, and in your kindness, Accept these your servants' offerings, that what each has offered to the honor of your name may serve the salvation of all through Christ our Lord. You are indeed holy, O Lord, and all you have created rightly gives you praise. For through your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, by the power and working of the Holy Spirit, you give life to all things and make them holy. And you never cease to gather a people to yourself, so that from the rising of the sun to its setting, a pure sacrifice may be offered to your name. Therefore, O Lord, we humbly implore you, 
by the same Spirit graciously make holy these gifts we have brought to you for consecration, that they may become the body and blood of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, at whose command we celebrate these mysteries. For on the night he was betrayed, he himself took bread, and giving you a thanks, he said the blessing, broke the bread, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this full of you and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. <laughs> In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice, and giving your thanks, he said the blessing, and gave the chalice to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. Mysterium Fidei. Therefore, O Lord, as we celebrate the memorial of the saving passion of your Son, his wondrous resurrection and ascension into heaven, and as we look forward to his second coming, we offer you in thanksgiving this holy and living sacrifice. Look, we pray, upon the oblation of your church, and recognizing the sacrificial victim by whose death you will to reconcile us to yourself, Grant that we who are nourished by the body and blood of your Son and filled with his Holy Spirit may become one body, one spirit in Christ. May he make of us an eternal offering to you so that we may obtain an inheritance with your elect, especially with the most blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with blessed Joseph, her spouse, with your blessed apostles and glorious martyrs, and with all the saints, on whose constant intercession in your presence we rely for unfailing help. May this sacrifice of our reconciliation, we pray, O Lord, advance the peace and salvation of all the world. Be pleased to confirm in faith and charity your pilgrim church on earth, with your servant Francis our Pope and Robert our Bishop, the order of bishops, all the clergy, and the entire people you have gained for your own. Listen graciously to the prayers of this family whom you have summoned before you. In your compassion, O merciful Father, gather to yourself all your children scattered throughout the world. To our departed brothers and sisters, and to all who were pleasing to you at their passing from this life, give kind admittance to your kingdom. There we hope to enjoy forever the fullness of your glory, through Christ our Lord, through whom you bestow on the world all that is good. Through him and with him and in him, 
O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. The Savior's command and form by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
Let us pray. May the working of this heavenly gift, O Lord, we pray, take possession of our minds and bodies, so that its effects and not our own desires may always prevail in us through Christ our Lord. Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit.